times is my aim in this service, and so particularly in this intended enlargement, that it may be seen how much one poor man, simply by trusting in God, can bring about by prayer, and that thus other children of God may be led to carry on the work of God in dependency upon Him, and that children of God may be led increasingly to trust in Him in their individual positions and circumstances. Therefore, I am led to this further enlargement. Prayer and Trust in God There are other points in which I would be glad to point out that is to be found in Mr. Mueller's narrative, but one more must suffice. It is the lesson of firm and unwavering trust in God's promise as the secret of persevering prayer. If once we have, in submission to the teaching of the Spirit and the Word, taken hold of God's promise and believe that the Father has heard us, we must not allow ourselves by any delay or unfavorable appearances to be shaken in our faith. The full answer to my daily prayers was far from being realized, yet there was abundant encouragement granted by the Lord to continue in prayer. But suppose even that far less had come in than was received still after having come to the conclusion upon scriptural grounds, after much prayer and self-examination, I ought to have gone on without wavering in the exercise of faith and patience concerning this object. And thus all the children of God, when one satisfied about anything which they bring before God in prayer, is according to his will, ought to continue in believing, expecting, persevering prayer until the blessing is granted. Thus am I myself now waiting upon God for certain blessings, for which I have daily besought him for ten years and six months without one day's intermission. Still, the full answer is not yet given concerning the conversion of certain individuals, though in the meantime I have received many thousands of answers to prayer. I have also prayed daily without intermission for the conversion of other individuals about ten years, for others six or seven years, for others three to two years, and still the answer is not yet granted concerning those persons, while in the meantime many thousands of my prayers have been answered and also souls converted, for whom I have been praying. I lay particular stress on this for the benefit of those who may suppose that I need only to ask God and receive it once, or that I may pray concerning anything, and the answer would surely come. One can only expect to obtain answers to prayer, which are according to the mind of God, and even then, patience and faith may be exercised for many years, even as mine are exercised in the matter to which I have referred. And yet am I daily continuing in prayer and expecting the answer, and so surely expecting the answer, that I have often thanked God that he will surely give it, though now for nineteen years faith and patience have thus been exercised. Be encouraged, dear Christians, with fresh earnestness to give yourselves to prayer, if you can only be sure that you ask things which are for the glory of God. But the most remarkable point is this, that six pounds, six shillings, six dimes from Scotland supplied me, as far as can be known now, with all the means necessary for fitting up and promoting the new orphan houses. Six years and eight months I have been, day by day, and generally seven, several times daily, asking the Lord to give me the needed means for the enlargement of the orphan work, which, according to the calculations made in the spring of 1861, appeared to be about 15,000 pounds, but which at a later period was found to be, to be about 58,000 pounds. The total of this amount I have now received. I praise and magnify the Lord for putting this enlargement of the work into my heart and for giving me courage and faith for it, and above all, for sustaining my faith day by day without wavering. When the last portion of the money was received, I was no more assured considering the whole than I was at the time I had not received one single donation towards this large sum. I was at the beginning, after once having ascertained his mind through most patient and heart-searching waiting upon God, as fully assured that he would bring it about as if the two houses with their hundreds of orphans occupying them had been already before me. I made a few remarks here for the sake of young believers in connection with this subject. 1. Be slow to take new steps in the Lord's service, or in your business, or in your families. Weigh everything well. 
weigh all in the light of the Holy Scriptures and in the fear of God. 2. Seek to have no will of your own in order to assert the mind of God regarding any steps you purpose taking so that you can honestly say you are willing to do the will of God if he will only please to instruct you. 3. But when you have found out what the will of God is, seek for his help, and seek it earnestly, perseveringly, patiently, believingly, expectantly, and you will surely in his own time and way obtain it. To suppose that we have difficulty about money only would be a mistake. There occur hundreds of other wants and of other difficulties. It is a rare thing that a day occurs without some difficulty or some want. Often there are many difficulties and many wants to be met and overcome the same day. All these are met by prayer and faith, our universal remedy, and we have never been confounded. Patient, persevering, believing prayer, offered up to God in the name of the Lord Jesus, has always, sooner or later, brought the blessing. I do not despair, by God's grace, of obtaining any blessing, provided I can be sure it would be for any real good and for the glory of God. With Christ in the School of Prayer. We're in the very last section, Reverend Andrew Murray, President of the Cape General Mission, reprinted from the South African Pioneer. The name of Andrew Murray has been for many years well known throughout South Africa and later through his books. There are few names more familiar in the English-speaking world than that of the author of Abiding Christ. The father of Andrew Murray came out from Scotland nearly 70 years ago and became an honored minister of the Dutch Reformed Church at Graf Reinet. His work was richly blessed, but his great legacy to South Africa was his family, five of his sons becoming devoted ministers of the Dutch Reformed Church and four of his daughters ministers' wives, while another daughter is the principal of a large school for girls. The second son, Andrew, bearing his father's name, was born at Graf Reinet, May 9, 1828, and it is this Scott Africander with whom we are now concerned. When his eldest brother was sent home to Aberdeen to complete his classic studies, Andrew, then only nine years of age, accompanied him. Both brothers became in time students and graduates of Marshall, that's M-A-R-I-S-C-H-A-L, college. Here, both the lads drank deeply of the missionary and evangelical spirit they had already received from their reverend father. Here, they frequently heard William Burns, afterwards the notable missionary to China, and they caught not a little of his heroic spirit. After graduation, they went to Holland to complete their theological education at the University of Utrecht, that's U-T-R-E-C-H-T. Here they were soon the center of a circle of earnest disciples and both took an active part in the formation of the Student Missionary Society. When the curriculum of uh, Utrecht was finished, they returned to South Africa, the older brother ultimately becoming a professor in the Dutch Theological Seminary at Stolenbosch, while the younger Ander was appointed the minister over what is now the Orange Free State. Mr. Murray was only 20 years of age when he was ordained to this work, and for a long period he was the only minister in this wide territory. But he was not dismayed, fixing his headquarters at both um, Bloom Fountain. He entered upon his labors with untiring energy. The farmers were not well pleased with the youthful appearance of their pastor, but when they heard his first sermon, they found there was one before them whose youth was not to be despised. And when they witnessed the amount of writing, preaching, catechism, and family visitation done by the young minister, not only in the Free State, but beyond their borders in the Transvaal, the surprise gave way to esteem. 
The people gladly gathered in large numbers to worship with him, generally in large air, sometimes under sails stretched as a protection from the burning sun. The influence of this activity is still felt in the Ho district. In traveling through the free state in Transvaal, one is continually meeting those whom he had joined in marriage or those whom he had baptized, and many a one speaks of him as a spiritual father and has some loving remembrances of his visits. While thus engaged in a free state, Mr. Murray found a helpmate for himself in the person of Miss Emma Rutherford, the daughter of Honorable H.E. Rutherford, well known as a staunch friend and general supporter of the Lord's work in the whole country. It may be readily believed that it was no paradisic, and it's P-A-R-A-D-I-S-A-I-C, locality that the bride was taken, but for the sake of her husband and the gospel of the master, she bravely faced and started all the hardships of life on the frontier. That these were often severe enough appears in the fact that after some years, Mr. Murray was prostrated by fever and was long in recovering from the results of the ordeal. His physicians declared that he would never be a strong man again, but as it proved, this was simply a turning point in what was to be a yet more extended service for the young minister shortly afterwards. In 1860, received a call to Wilchester, an important island town of Cape Colony, about 80 miles from Cape Town. He accepted it and once again found cause to praise God, who founded him in his new sphere with fresh triumphs of his grace. It was at this time that the great wave of revival, which beginning with America and Ireland and sweeping over the eastern world, rolled in gladness also over South Africa. There was at Rochester a very marvelous manifestation of the convincing and converting power of the Spirit of Christ. A multitude of souls were gathered into the kingdom, and the hands of the Lord's servant were full of work. Those who knew Mr. Murray intimately speak in the warmest terms of the wise and, gr and gracious influence he exercised at the time in the wave of enduring, endeavoring to seize and turn to the best account the spiritual earnestness of the time, and yet prevent it from falling into confusion and fantasism. It was while pastor at Wilchester that Mr. Murray began to present some of his utterances in literary form. Among the first of his books was a little volume entitled, Why Do You Not Believe? Another named, The New Life, a series of counsels to young Christians who have lately entered the narrow way. Both of these, and especially the latter, have been much blessed in many, and are still widely circulated at the Cape and in Holland. As we have indicated, there were first written in Dutch. So also were two other volumes which he published at this period, Abide in Christ and The Children for Christ. After remaining at Wilchester for four years, Mr. Murray accepted a call to Cape Town, where he remained about the same length of time. The work here was felt by him to be encompassed by many difficulties. There were three Dutch colonies in Dutch churches in the city, in which, according to the methods still purposed in Holland, three ministers preached in turn. The arrangements prevented the growth of that strong pastoral sympathy, which Mr. Murray had hitherto found a most valuable element in his work. He asked that he might have a church and a portion of the people as his own congregation. This was declined. He felt free to wait for a door of the word in another quarter. This at last came through a call to Wellington, a pleasant, pleasant town about 45 miles from Cape Town, on the part of a congregation largely composed of descendants of French Huguenot families who had fled thither in the days of their tribulation and became associated with the Dutch Reformed Church. It is in this sphere that Mr. Murray still lives and works with great joy and success. The people have plainly inherited the blessing promised to thousands of them that love the Lord and keep his commandments. And this is seen in the fact that again and again 
there have been most blessed times of refreshing and large harvest of souls for the kingdom of the Lord. This under God is largely due to the single-hearted resolve of the pastor to know nothing among the people but Christ and Him crucified, and to seek above all things the salvation of souls. There are very few ministers of our day who have a keener sense, a keener insight into sacred truth. It would be a mistake, however, to suppose that successful as Mr. Murray is as a pastor, he is a pastor and nothing more. He has also done a grand work as a Christian educationalist. Even in his first charge, he spared no pains to get good teachers for his people. And he has pursued the same aim ever since. This desire has been fulfilled with remarkable success in Wellington. Shortly after his removal thither, he became acquainted with the life and work of Mary Lyon of Mount Holinick Seminary in America and became fired with the resolve to have a similar institution in South Africa where the conversions and Christian education of girls might be made the chief aim. This is what I have always wanted, said he. In sending for teachers to England or Scotland, I have no security that they will understand this aim or either fully into or enter fully into it. I shall send to America for teachers. He did so, and being fortunate enough to secure the services of Mrs. Ferguson and Bliss of Holonick, that's H O L Y O K E. He founded in seventeen I'm sorry, 1874 the Hunat Seminary at Wellington, over which these ladies still preside. There are about 200 young ladies from all parts of South Africa being educated on the methods of Mount Holy Keep and in the same spirit. A minister of the Dutch Reformed Church of Cape Town tells us, It is difficult to say in a few words what blessings this institution has conferred in South Africa, not only by the education in a Christian spirit of many hundreds of young ladies, but also of a large number of them having become teachers imbued with the spirit of the Huna Seminary. The story of the conversions and revivals of this institution, writes another, is quite wonderful. And now there are several schools throughout the country which look to the Hunan Seminary as their mother and work on the same principles. The most prominent feature in the whole education is the paramount importance attached to the Christian missions. While maintaining this oversight of his flock in the Christian schools of the province, Mr. Murray is as much as ever bent on carrying forward of evangelization. In this direction, he has had marvelous blessing. After his work at Wellington became known, no one was in greater request for taking part in special services in, in other congregations throughout the country. Often he has found many souls just waiting to be brought into the kingdom and has given the message that led them to Christ. With such plain indications of the finger of God before him, it is little to be wondered at that Mr. Murray should have been led to think that he ought to have the work of an evangelist occupying a larger portion of his time. The way for this was not at first plain. A prolonged illness in 1879, for one thing, interrupted this service. But after granting him a remarkable recovery from it, the Lord is pleased also to show his congregation that this line of effort was to bulk very largely in his future work. He came in great power and blessing to the people. There was an ingathering of souls such as never had that they never had experienced before. And when the church was made willing and ready to allow their pastor to devote at least half his time to evangelistic work in the uh, prosecution of this service during the last six years, Mr. Murray has found the Lord making manifest the Savior, the Savior of his knowledge by him in almost every place he has visited. His tours on special missions have of late extended not only to eastern providence of the colony, but also to the Free State, Transvaal, and Natal. And we are informed that there are hardly any congregations in those different states where there are not found those who now look up to him as their spiritual father and who have been helped by his preaching on their way Zionward. Mr. Murray has also established at Wellington a training seminary for missionaries to the uh, Kafirs, that's K-A-F-I-R-S, and other tribes. Here a much similar course of study is required for the ordinary pastors. The students are ordained simply as missionaries, 
that they do a work which could not be carried on by any other agency. Amongst Mr. Murray's own relations, also the missionary spirit is still being deeply cherished. It is but recently that one of his nephews, Reverend Andrew C. Murray, has gone to Lake um, Nyasia, N-Y-A-S-S-A, as a missionary of the Dutch Church, and is cooperating with the other Scott uh, brethren already there. In connection with his work as an evangelist, Mr. Murray has been led to take a deep interest in the movement now ever we're making such progress towards lifting up professing Christians to a higher plane of spiritual life and service. In this work also, the Lord has caused his servant to prosper greatly. Singleness of eye for the glory of Christ in souls is the secret of his success. No attempt is made to dazzle by words of wisdom or by the overstraining of biblical questions. Everything that might attract the hearer to the speaker himself is laid aside. And hence, some have said about his preaching that we have noticed some critics saying of his books that there is a want of zeal and brilliancy in his style. That as one of our co-dependents says, I think all will admit that they never heard him without being stirred up from the very foundation and made to feel as if they were only beginning the Christian life and had yet to learn what full trust and consecration means. It is with this same power that his last four works, works like Christ, with Christ, holy in Christ, and the Spirit of Christ, are fraught. All of them are written at Wellington, and only after the topics they, dealt, they deal with have been studied and meditated on and spoken about at Christian conferences on subjects akin to them. So lives and works, then this faithful servant of Christ, he has a remarkable power of winning the confidence of men, and we learned without surprise that even in earlier years, he was twice appointed a deputy of important missions to England in connection with civil questions in this country. But the church is his chosen field of work, moderator of uh, Synod, that's S-Y-N-O-D, for no less than three years. He is honored and loved by all his ministerial brethren. We consider the Cape General Mission a true answer to his many prayers and his valuable advice as our president has been greatly blessed. End of the book, With Christ in the School of Prayer, by Andrew Murray.